We have also from Cleveland, I see here, welcome. And Efrat, if you can just put us again, everyone on mute. Can you please? Um, okay. Um, no, I don't see that everyone. Did you put all of us on mute? Okay, fantastic. Good. So, um, and hello from Vancouver. Great, amazing. Yes. Yes, welcome. Okay, so I'm going to record. Now it's recording and let's start. So, um, welcome all. Um, to our Gvanim Limud uh, session. This is the first session that we are doing in English. And um, it's a real gift to see you all here. Um, a few words about Gvanim Limud and then about Rabbi Yarik, and I'm going to give Rabbi Yarik to lead us tonight. Um, so just to let you know, we are going to put you all an, an, on mute. However, we are Israelis, okay? So you are more than welcome at any point to unmute yourself and to share and to think together. And I guess, um, Rabbi Eric, you probably, at one point, if people will be quiet and polite. Um, so at the end, I'm sure we will have time also for a dialogue, but seriously, we, it's, it's the fourth meeting of Gvanim Limud just in the past 10 days. And we have it every second day, mostly in Hebrew. And this is the first time in English. And it's a real gift, like we love the Limud together. We come here to learn. We come here to be a big Chavruta, a large Chavruta in time when we are isolated and we have the gift to share and to learn and to meet each other. Now, Gvanim Limud is part of the Israeli-American Council with the ISC. And the idea of Gvanim Limud all over the year, and I'm so proud because we have here at least two people that I know personally who lead Gvanim Limud in their cities. So Gvanim Limud is the idea that people from the community, they have the courage and they say, we want to learn. We want to open the, um, the Arona Sfarim Yehudi, the Jewish incredible wide shelf of books, um, Jewish and Hebrew, and we want to meet together and to create community by learning together. Um, so Gvanim Limud is happening now in 20 um 23 different cities and it's growing and growing and as the uh, corona um, came to our lives and um, one of the first things that we wanted to do is to keep learning so we decided to move um to move and to have also meetings together as a community and to invite people who maybe before didn't have the chance to learn together with us in Gvanim Limud and to meet our incredible teachers um, who come here and volunteer to come and, and teach us. Um, normally it's done in the cities by the community members, which is incredible. I see here Lee, I see here Avi, and I, I see here Dikla. So we have here Seattle, Vegas, we have here Boston who lead and some others. Um, and, and what we are going to do, this is the first time that we said like, but we want also to learn with American Jewish community. We want to invite people that Hebrew is you know, they heard it when we got the Torah from Sinai, but they didn't have the chance every day to speak Hebrew. So how can we do a limud? How can we bring the Israeli-American the, the Israeli -American community and the American Jewish community to study together and to see the wisdom that each one can contribute? And this is where tonight is the first um, meeting. We're going to have um, next Tuesday with Rabbi Analia Boards. Um, we are going to have another one in English. And meanwhile, we're going to have also sessions on Thursday in Hebrew and on Sunday in Hebrew. Um, so this is my introduction to I Seek Vanim Limud um, online. And now I have the real gift to, to introduce you and to invite my teacher and my friend, Rabbi Eric Gurvis. Um, and Eric and me, we have a few years of um, friendship from time where I was living in Jerusalem you were living in uh, Boston, and um, you were a huge, a huge, I will say, lover of Jerusalem. Um, it's a, you know, these people who care so much about what's going on in Israel and Jerusalem, and and the relationship between the American Jewish community and the and the state of Israel and the people of Israel. And uh, Rabbi Eric, now you are you you moved to to Ashland, Massachusetts, and you now you're the rabbi of Sharei Shalom congregation and also one of the best gifts 
you are one of the teachers of the Musar, Musar Institute, the Musar movement, which is, the, the, you will speak more about that, but it's like a gift that was, were, was hidden, I think for many of us, you know, for many of us that we didn't know that we have, oh, for you too, okay, so you will teach us. It's, um, it's a genre and a way of thinking about, about um, Jewish values and ethics um, that was always there and now it's coming to America and it's blooming, it's really blooming. And um, so Rabbi Yarik, Todaraba that you came and volunteered to teach us. Again, I really want to encourage all of you here to focus on the picture now of Rabbi Eric, as I'm going to be quiet, and so you can see him on the full screen. Rabbi Eric, toda rabba, bevakasha. Rav todot la mori v'chaveri yakir, v'ani mo'od sameach liot itchem ha'erev v'ayc v'gvanim v'biyamim ha'ele. Ze kashe ma'od. לכולנו. ואני אפילו uh, הבאתי קצת רוגלוך ממרזיפן uh, ברחוב אגריפס. Uh, it's a long story. My, my son's girlfriend came back from Israel just a week or two ago and she brought him a gift. I told her this is his favorite thing in the world. And uh, if only I could beam it through the camera for all of us. Although he didn't leave very much, it's it's almost gone. Um, so Yakir specifically asked me to speak tonight in English, because there are some of you in Givanim and in the IAC for sure who have family members and partners who don't speak Hebrew, and so the idea behind offering some of these sessions in English is to open the broader community, and I am uh, really really honored. And you, uh, I urge you to come next week for Analia Bortz as well. She's an incredible rabbi and colleague. And actually, we know each other, and I know Yakir initially through a connection with the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. And my dear friend and brother and classmate at the Hartman Institute, Rabbi Jacob Herber, has joined us from Milwaukee as well. And uh, he actually works with the Hartman Institute right now. So um, I want to start, how did I end up here? Because Yakir mentioned that Musar is a, something most of us don't know much about. I will tell you, and, and, and maybe Rabbi Herber would say the same, when we were in rabbinic school, which for me was in the late 1970s, early 1980s, it was in, it was in the last century, although at this point I call two weeks ago the old days. Um, Maybe we heard the word Musar. And as much as any of us could have told you, we would have said it has something to do with ethics. So that's all, that's all we would mention. We didn't study it. Certainly we didn't know from it as a practice. And in brief, the way I came to Musar was uh, almost, almost incidentally and by mistake. I have a dear friend, another colleague who lives here in Boston, we have been study partners since 2004. We meet every week. In fact, tomorrow morning, right here on Zoom, we're, we're meeting to study. And we had been studying for many years. And we were studying rabbinic texts. We started with Talmud, Gemara. We had a teacher from Jerusalem, Eben Leader, and uh, who lived in, lives here in Boston. And, and after a period of time, my friend said, you know, I love what we're studying, but would you mind if we do something different? to which my response has always been, I don't care what I study, I care that I study. And I mean study for my own sake, Torah Lishma. So um, we kind of bounced around for a few weeks. What are we gonna do? What would we like to learn? And he said, why don't we look into Musar? So uh, we figured, all right, that's, you know, we don't know anything. I had read a book recently about Musar. I had heard a couple of lectures didn't really know much of what it was about. Uh, and I was just at the end of my three year program at the Hartman Institute and was kind of looking for what was gonna be next. And also I, I should mention in passing that I also had my first exposure to yoga and mindfulness around the same time. It's not connected and it's very connected. So we started to study Musar. We studied actually, uh, Yakir, can you put up the first slide? 
we studied a piece of writing by Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, the next one. Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, uh, back one. That's him. So Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, as you can see, lived in the 19th century. He was a Lithuanian uh, rabbi. And he, towards the middle of his experience, decided that the students in his yeshiva were remarkable young men and very devoted to their, to their studies, their limudim, and it was all day and all night in Gemara, basically like any other yeshiva. And he said, you know, that's all good, but that's not enough because we're not going out and living our Judaism. We have to practice what it means to live the teachings that we spend all day in the yeshiva, in the study hall, the Beit Midrash focused on. So Rav Salanter made what was considered by many, by the early Hasidim, by uh, the Maskilim, the enlightened uh, intellectuals of Europe, and, and by the Orthodox, uh, the Misnagdim, uh, known by some as uh, known as the Misnagdim by some, the Haredim, we might say in today's language. To, to most of them, it was a radical concept. We're going to take one hour a day, late at night, and stop studying Talmud and learn from these other books of our Jewish tradition. And then we're also going to start to think about how not only do we learn it, but how do we live it. And Rav Salanter was just lambasted and attacked. You know, it, it's not new, it's old. We can go back to biblical times and the rebellion of Korach against Moses and Aaron. We can go to the post-biblical period and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the rabbis and, and their opponents. I mean, we Jews have mastered the art of being um, vocal about what we don't like about what the other person has said. And I know that Yakir uh, asked you to all be very attentive and polite. Um, but you've all visited the Knesset at one time or another. So you have an image of, of what I'm discussing. And while I'm not watching it, I have a hunch it's going on in the halls of our own government here in the United States right now, rather vocally. Salanter said, look, we're going to take one hour a day. One hour a day. And yet he was attacked. But what he did was he began to promote, and he went back and dug up all these books and writings that had been developed. And, le and let me step back a second and make it clear. The word Musar's in the Tanakh, it's in the Bible, means instruction. And the concept of Musar as a way of guiding how you live your life, we already have writings from Bachya Ibn Pakuda in the ninth century and Sajid Gaon in the 10th century. And down through the centuries, a whole literature if you imagine, uh, we just moved to our new home a few months ago, so I only have a few bookshelves so far. But um, if you imagine that, the da, if you imagine those, each one of those shelves is a different discipline, a different tochen in, in, in our Jewish library, Musar was just one, but it was a full shelf. And nobody knew. Nobody knew. In truth, Maimonides wrote Musar teachings. I, I studied them intensely for my rabbinic thesis at the end of my years in rabbinic school, but I didn't know they were Musar. And well, that's a whole different story. So he turned his students' attention to studying this literature, but not just studying, he wanted them to live it. So he taught them, and this was not new to Judaism, but for some Jews it was new, to meditate, to actually meditate in the same way that some of the mindfulness practices of our time and parallel to some of the teachings of Buddhist tradition around practice, uh, around focusing. So you focus every morning on what am I going to work on today? And the key concept, the core of the Musar tradition is what is known in Hebrew, you know the word, midot. Now, midah in Hebrew, you know, means a measure. In the language of Musar, uh, in the language of Maimonides, the Rambam, midah is a virtue. In the language of Musar, 
Midah means a soul trait, a soul trait. And we all have all of the soul traits. We'll get to a list of them in a moment. And then Rav Salanter said, but let's also take a few minutes each day and whatever Midah we're working on, let's say it's humility, Anava. So you're not only going to focus in the morning on Anava, today's my day to work on Anava, tomorrow, a whole week, two weeks, whatever it was, but you're also going to, at some point in the day, step out of what you're doing and do some what he called Kabbalot practices. Five minutes, 10 minutes to just, not just think about Anava or Kavod, honor, or Hakarata Tov, gratitude, recognizing the good, or Savlanut, which is a, a, an interesting word in the Israeli culture, I know. Um, I have I've had many experiences practicing sablanut in many misradim from from the namal at ufa from the airport to the post office to changing money in the bank to you know what I'm talking about um, and on and on and on there's a whole list I'm going to show you in a minute and it's not a complete list and then at night he wanted his students and the practitioners of Musar to reflect. Let's think about where did this show up in my day? And he called it cheshbon and nefesh, soul accounting. But it's really the practice of journaling in a Musar sense. So every day you take a minute, two minutes in the morning to focus on your midah. During the day, you take a few minutes out of your day and practice. And, and I could say more about it, but we have limited time tonight. So that's for another time. And then at the end of the day, where did I see Anava? Where was it a challenge for me? Where did I see it in other people? Where did I see the absence of Anava? Uh, one need only turn on the television in, in both of our beloved countries to have a myriad of examples of the absence of Anava um, on a daily basis. So, uh, and then the next day you get up and you start again. Six days a week, not Shabbat. And, and that became the Musar practice. And he would take the, the treasures off the bookshelf and reintroduce them. And then he taught his key disciples and sent them out to establish yeshivot, which they did. And different schools of Musar fought and practice developed. I'm not going to go into that in great length tonight. Tonight, what I want to do is rather um, share with you just a few of the principles, a few of the traits, and here's why. I believe that Musar, and, and Yakir said Musar is having a rebirth. In fact, let me just go back a half step. Musar in the Bible, a Musar literature that developed from the ninth cent century on, a Musar movement that begins in Lithuania in the mid 19th century, and as you all know all too well, for reasons we all understand, nearly perished because the scene, primarily not exclusively, was Eastern Europe. And so during the Holocaust, even though Musar schools had been set up in England and in Germany and in Israel, and there still are, by and large, Musar almost vanished in the Holocaust. And then about 30 years ago, Two figures in particular, not only, but two primary figures, Rabbi Ira Stone of Philadelphia, conservative rabbi, and Alan Marinus, who is uh, something of a Renaissance man. The man has lived many lives. And in the midst of a deep personal crisis, went and found a Rebbe in, in Far Rockaway, New York, and started to study in the Rebbe's yeshiva and learned Musar. And then he said, this is so important, I want to share it. And so he founded, I, I've lost track about 14, 15 years ago, the Musar Institute, for whom I have the privilege of a little bit of part-time work. And um, Alan and Ira Stone were almost single-handedly responsible for the Renaissance, the rebirth. I mean, literally, because if you go around North America, for sure, but also around the world, and I will tell you here in Boston, there must be 40 or 50 Musar groups. In fact, the end of next month, we were, we were supposed to have had our second annual Musar conference. Last year, with lousy publicity and late publicity, we had over 200 people. 
This year, we probably would have had 400 people together in one of the synagogues spending a whole day learning Musart with Alan Marinus as the, the primary speaker. Alas, like everything else in our lives, it has now been set aside. And in truth, all of the Musart groups that I lead, I lead in Zoom. I meet my groups almost every night of the week, one group each group on a different night, and people are doing it all around the world. So here's why Yakir and I decided that I would share a little bit of Musar with you tonight. Musar is about, thank you, next slide, one of the um, relatively contemporary Musar masters, Rob Elialopi, and only died, what, 50 years ago, um, said that Musar is making the heart feel what the mind already knows. It's a great statement. We know we're supposed to exhibit humility. We know we're supposed to show gratitude and honor. We know that we're supposed to struggle and strive for patience. And I could go down the list. We know it. But we've got to make the heart and the soul feel it and live it. And, you know, when I started studying Musar with my Chevruta partner, it was academic. It was intellectual. Part of that was the influence of the Hartman Institute. But then I stumbled into getting trained as a Musar leader by Alan Marinus. And then I started leading Musar groups. And then I started studying it more and more and more. And now if I could show you my bookshelves and my desks, they're all filled with books because I'm in the middle of six different projects uh, on Musar. And Musar, in a very real sense, grounded my life in a time where I was finding that I'm not sure I want to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm not sure I understand the world I'm living in. I, I'm not sure that, that I understand why people are so at one another's throats and there's so much incivility and, and disregard and disrespect and lack of tolerance. And Musar grounded me. My Chevruta partner and I, after we finished a few uh, courses with the Musar Institute, started studying a 16th century text called Orchot Sadikim. Literally, we read it page by page in one of the public libraries between our homes here in Massachusetts, in Boston. And we'd sit there every Wednesday morning reading and translating. And within five minutes of any session's beginning, we looked at each other and said, we don't, nobody knows who the author of this book is and the author lived in the 16th century. How did the author read the Boston Globe this morning? Because this person is talking about what I heard on the news on my way here. It was astonishing on any midah, any topic that we were, we spent almost three years studying that book. And then we went on to another book and another book. And now, now we're doing uh, studies in the weekly Torah portion with different Musar masters for each of the five books. And um, Musar has so grounded my life. And in this time in particular, where we are living, not just every day, but every hour and sometimes every minute with just a pile of uncertainties, fear all around us, people are, are trapped in their homes or afraid to go out of their homes. You know, one state after another, one city after another, locking down and telling us, don't go to the grocery store, don't go. My grandchildren, I have two grandsons, six months and three years old. They live about 25 minutes from here. I haven't seen them in almost three weeks. And my daughter, who lives in New York right now, told my wife earlier today, he hasn't said this to you, but you may not see them until this is over. Which is, she got on, it's crazy. First of all, we're healthy, they're healthy. Get in your car, come to my house, which is out in the open and air and nobody living around us, and we'll be okay. But this is the world we're living in. And I know that I'm not alone. And alachat kama v'kama, if we look across to Israel, where we know we feel every illness, every death, every crisis is personal. And we look at Israel, and Israel, first of all, is light years ahead of, of the United States in at least 
addressing the crisis. There's a little more honesty about the reality of the crisis, but Israel is completely locked down. And I know I don't have to explain to anybody on this call who's Israeli or, or, or who has spent diff, uh, serious time in Israel, uh, what it means to live. This is a different fear. And the reality is the other one's not gone. Uh, the last summer I was in Israel, I think it was three years ago, and Rav Herber and I were studying in Jerusalem, and it was during the summer of the Tzeva Adon. It was, you know, I mean, we ran for shelters just like everybody else more times than I care to remember. And actually, that, that's, that a missile that hit by Ben Gurion Airport was the day before I was supposed to fly home, and I couldn't leave for a while. So that's one level of fear, and it's a real fear because it's those are real issues. But now we're living with an enemy that nobody can see, and nobody knows who it is and where it is and what it is, and it doesn't matter whether you're a Drew, a Christian, a Muslim, an atheist, uh, it doesn't matter your nationality, we are all in this together. So feeling in our hearts, what our minds know takes on yet another layer of meaning. Yakir, can we show the next slide? So this comes from a video. If you look at the very bottom where it says, bottom right, where it says, let it ripple.org. And there'll be a slide again at the end. If you go to that website, and look for a film that the filmmaker Tiffany Schlein made called The Making of a Mensch. You'll see an 11 minute video. It's very entertaining and it'll teach you a lot about Musar, but this slide is taken from that film because this is a list of some of the midot that we deal with in Musar. Not, again, not all, there are lists and lists and lists. Creativity, yet, whoa, Yitzira. Bravery, omets lev, a very important midah in our time. Ahava, love, another important. Perseverance, netzach, yosher, integrity or honesty. Chesed, din, ahava, achrayut. I mean, you can go around that list. Those are all soul traits that every one of us has. But here, I'm sorry. There's an extreme over here, and there's an extreme over here. So let's go back to Anava for a moment, humility. There's the person who has, oh, what happened to the Hebrew there? It turned into gibberish. Oh, well, um, we'll get to that in a moment. There was Hebrew where you see those funny uh, configurations when I sent it yesterday. So um, the person who has no Anava whatsoever, totally self-absorbed, I'm the most important, the world is about me. And then there's the person who has so much humility that they become like a doormat, like a shmata. And, and they don't have a sense of self and they never stand up for themselves. In the Musar tradition, this comes from Maimonides, but others as well, the goal is not to be here and not to be there, but to be somewhere in what I'll call the broad middle. Actually, Maimonides calls it shvil hazahav, the middle path. The, the golden way. And it's not a precise path. We're each, actually we walk through life balancing. So sometimes if my ego, my, my lack of anava is getting a little out of touch, I, a little out of whack, I have to go towards, not to the other extreme. If I'm a person with no self-esteem and no self-worth, then I have to stand up for myself. And the goal is to eventually find balance in the middle. So what I want to do tonight is share just three or four midot and some very, very short examples. The texts are usually much longer. Um, now go back. And just to give you a taste of why I think Musar is such an incredible tool in this time. Next one. Brother Eric, may I ask a question? You can. Better. Thank you. Can you, when you are going down to example us, um, can you speak a little bit, I wonder what's the difference between Musar and um, general ethics, like to be good or, um, is, like, is it 
a Jewish way to speak something which is a human? Yes. Or is it something which has a uniqueness that because, you know, each religion or each um, path of spirituality create focus on something unique, so also the Jewish Musar um, focus on something in your opinion which is maybe different than other cultures or okay. other... Um, so I, I would love when you're going now to lead no, no, us into that. an example. Um, back one. Back another one. <laughs> so just imagine that that top line actually says in Hebrew, Minuchat HaNefesh. So each one of these traits is universal. Um, much as we like to have a good sense of self-esteem and, and pride in our, our tradition and our people and, and our accomplishments, Anava is not a, a Jewish quality. Kavod, honor, is not a Jewish quality. Gratitude, go down that list that was on the previous slide. There's nothing uniquely Jewish. Here's what's Jewish. What's Jewish is that when you study and practice Musar, you're doing it through a Jewish lens. The teachings come from that bookshelf, our bookshelf. The teachings are applicable. I have given Alan Marinus's Musar books, written in you know, the last 10, 15 years, to Christian colleagues. They're fascinated. They want to know if I will teach them Musar. And the answer is yes. But they have to understand that the texts I teach come, the illustrations come from a Jewish example. Now I will say that when I lead Musar groups, I have brought teachings from Rumi, the Sufi mystic poet. I have brought teachings from uh, Sylvia Burstein, who though raised as a Jewish woman is a practic practicing Buddhist. I have brought poetry from non-Jewish, because the values, and Yakir, thank you for asking it, the values are universal. The Musar path is a Jewish path to universal values. My teacher who lives in Beit Shemesh, uh, my colleague, he, he, my boss and my colleague at the Musar Institute, uh, Rabbi Avi Fertig says that the goal of Musar is to make you the best version of the person you are capable of being. Let me say that again. The best version of the person you are capable of being. So again, I'll stick with Anava, then I'm gonna to switch to Minuchat HaNefesh. We like to think of ourselves, most of us, as having a balance of, of humility. But we have to step out and focus. We have to look honestly in the mirror. We have to stretch our muscles a little bit. Musar is not about ever getting to the goal, it's about aiming for the goal or to quote a different book that doesn't come from Jewish tradition, though it liberally quotes Jewish tradition, there's a book I read oh, probably 30 years ago called The Spirituality of Imperfection. And I can summarize the core teaching of the authors of that book in one line. We are imperfect beings living in an imperfect world. Now, doesn't that sound like tikkun olam? Imperfect beings living in an imperfect world. Our goal in life is not to become perfect. Thank God, because most of us, I know I won't get there. Our goal, our responsibility is to perfect ourselves. There is a difference between making yourself better and saying I'm perfect. And Musar says the same thing. So go back to the slide on Minuchat HaNefesh. In a Musar sense, Minuchat HaNefesh, I don't have to translate the Hebrew for this group, the calmness of the soul, the tranquility. So Rabbi Menachem Mendelefin, who was a century before Rav Salanter, and not a Musar guy, nevertheless wrote a Musar book. It's called Cheshvon and Nefesh. And he says in his chapter, I think it's the first or second chapter, on Minuchat Nefesh, rise above events that are inconsequential, both good and bad. They're not worth disturbing your equanimity. And Minuchat HaNefesh in the Musar world is often called equanimity. Don't we need balance? Don't we need some way to uh, attain a sense of Minuchat HaNefesh in a time like this? Rise above the events that are in, don't we need to separate 
and we're all learning it every day right now. You know, I read something earlier today about um, a moment like this will make you realize you don't waste food. We are consuming everything in our cupboard, everything in our refrigerator. We are making do with everything. And in today's world, there are plenty of people who have nothing. We know that. That's our responsibility in Tikkun Olam and Tzedakah and Chesed and Gemilut Chasadim, topics for another time. But we are learning not to take anything for granted. Not relationships, not the freedom to go where we want to go and do what we want to do. You can't go to the movies. You can't go to the mall. You can't go out and play a sport where you throw a ball or a Frisbee to another person. Because if the other person, this is what I'm hearing anyway, catches that ball, whatever is on their fingers is transferred to the ball. So, you know, you can go out for a walk. My wife and I go for a walk every day. You know, the guy who runs the property where we now live said, six feet, six feet. You know, like we were, we were five feet apart. You know, if, if we're going to catch something from one another, it's too late. Um, but we have to find a way to notice the bad, notice the good, and not get distracted by the extremes, which is really hard in our world two weeks ago. And now we're learning it's really important to do that. Let's go to the next slide, Yakir. Um, this is a contemporary rabbi, Zelig Pliskin, um, and I can't actually see, oh, I'll move the, move the pictures. Worrying destroys one, one's life. Daga, worry. A life filled with worry is a miserable experience. <clears throat> Existence. How can you not be worried in today's world? Now, on a day-to-day -day basis, moment to moment, I'm not overrun with daga. But let's be, let's be honest. We don't know what we don't know. Like, like we've gone through things before. When, when war breaks, I've been in Israel at least five times for extended visits twice for years, um, where I've been there when, a, when a, a war, one of the operations breaks out. And look, it's an existential threat in Israel. I understand that. But we almost always know this will end. Everybody I know, my tour guides, my friends, my teachers, my neighbors, you know, this will last for, you know, and, and, then, and then we'll move on. David Broza. Yetov, we'll get past this. We don't know where the Yehiyetov, we want to believe Yehiyetov, but we don't know when that's going to come. You know, it's not two weeks, though some are saying two weeks. Is it two months? Is it six months? Is it the extreme of what some are saying, 18 months? We don't know. So we can't let Daga overrun us, but we also can't ignore it. And that's another trait. It's another nida for another time. But when you, as he says in the last line, if you constantly worry, you're destroying your own life. I'll give you an example from my life. I'm living in my house with my wife and my youngest son, 22 years old, supposed to graduate from college in six weeks. There won't be a graduation. That's not the end of the world, but it's, it, it's a pain for him. It's a real hurt. And um, we eat three meals a day together, uh, maybe two, because he doesn't always wake up when I wake up. But we eat meals together every day. For me, that's a blessing in the midst of a nightmare. And I am trying to focus on the blessing. I really am. Uh, Yakir, Hawa, let's uh, move to the next one. One of Rav Salanter's primary students was Rabbi Simcha Zissel Ziv of Kelm, also known as the altar, the elder of Kelm. And he founded one of those three schools. And here's his teaching. I happen to love his teachings. A person who has mastered peace of mind 
has gained everything. To obtain peace of mind, you need to be at peace with your emotions and desires. That is a lesson we can meditate on every day in what we're living through. All right, let's go on. I'm just going to give a few more illustrations because I just looked at the time. Uh, go, go to the next one. That's Sylvia Borstein, the Jubu that I mentioned. Another Mida, Hakarata Tov, which in Musar land is often called gratitude, but we know it really means recognizing the good. There's plenty of bad. So how do we lift up the good? So this teaching in front of you comes from Rabbi Nami Kelman, who's the Dean of Hebrew Union College in Jerusalem. And she writes that the offering of Thanksgiving, which we start reading from the Torah this week, the beginning of Sefer Vayikra, Leviticus, is the highest expression of gratitude. We praise and exalt and recognize the miracles of our lives. Now, I don't go through a single day in these last few weeks, and I imagine for weeks and months to come, where I won't focus on the reality. I'm not ignoring it. And um, I'm not ignoring the fear that I hear in my children's voices, ages 32 to 22. They're not kids. I'm not, my grandchildren don't have a clue what's going on. It's, a, it's an extended play date with their parents. Um, but we know that people around us are, are fearful. So how do we every day find something in the day, in the relationships, in divanim limud, in how many of you in the last week or two have had a, zo a social Zoom call? Okay, this weekend we did, we used to live in Teaneck, New Jersey. And some of our closest friends are the people that we raised our children with in Teaneck. So we had a happy hour, five o'clock on Sunday. Some of us had drinks, but we were all on the screen schmoozing. It wasn't a learning, it wasn't a meeting, we're all spending our days on Zoom. It was just being together in this new reality. And then two hours later, we had a family Zoom call with the children in New York and my wife's sisters and, and some of their kids. And, and you know what? That's our new reality, but we have to grab it. Cocooning, closing ourselves up is gonna be harmful to our mental and ultimately our physical health. Let's go on, Yagir. Um, Reverend, can I ask a quick question? And go on. So from, I've practiced um, Tai Chi and other kinds of uh, modalities of inner work. And one of the things that I've, throughout everything I've practiced to help bring us to the equilibrium and to this balance you're talking about is through the medium of the body. Is that a portion of anything in, in Musa or is that completely doesn't belong in, in what a great question, Lee. Thank you. Um, I've never really thought about it, but I, but I have an answer, which is often not the case. Um, remember I said you start the day by focusing and you end by journaling, cheshbon and nefesh. In the middle, you do some kabbalot. The kabbalot almost always involve something verbal or physical. Somebody in one of my groups once said, you know, Rabbi, I'm new to this. I don't have a lot of time in my life. Is it okay if for my Kabbalot and my journaling, I just think, look at what others do and, and, and I'll learn from that. And I said, that's okay, but Musar is not a spectator sport. Musar is not Kador Regel. It's not Kador Sal. It's not, uh, Jacob, you're here, so I'll say hockey. Um, it's not something you simply watch. Musar, so you have to put your whole self in. So in a sense, I'm not a practitioner of Tai Chi. I've done a little bit of yoga. You can't do yoga. Well, there are forms of yoga that you can do that are just meditative. Yoga Nidra, which is, involves sleep and calming the body. But, but there's a physicality to yoga. There's a, no, there's a physicality to Tai Chi. There can be a physicality to Musar. 
Actually, there's a, there's a relatively recent book called Musar Yoga. It's about how do you incorporate Musar into your yoga practice. And my teacher, Alan Marinus, actually wrote the introduction to the book. Okay, uh, are there other questions? Because I'm happy, I could go on, and I could go on with other midot, but, but I, I, I want you to take something away. So I want you to... Wow, a group of Israelis where nobody has a comment or a question. Yakir Atashomea, a Rebbe who who holech ba baderach. Mashiach, lo ha Rebbe. I know you in the background, so we. All right, let's go back and do just one or two more little pieces, and then I'll I'll stop with the presentation. Next slide, and the next slide. So um, here's a little kavana, a little intention whoa, that I actually wrote. It, there's a new book that just came out in December called the Musar Torah Commentary. And I was invited to write one of the chapters actually on a, on a portion that's coming up soon, Parshat Kedoshim, Leviticus 19. And so at the end of the chapter, and I was asked to reflect on Leviticus 19, which is the core of Jewish ethics, through the lens of Hakarat HaTov, which if somebody had said, do this portion, pick the Midot that you want to do, Hakarat HaTov would have been the last Midah I would have thought of. Not because it's a bad Midah, it just didn't feel apparent to me. So I had to study and study and study, and, and eventually I found a hook. It was actually with Rav Elia Lopian, who I quoted a few slides ago. So I wrote these words, on the way, let us not lose the Tov, the good within us and that which arises from us. Rather, let us shine light with Hakarat HaTov in recognition of the good that is in us. And let us utilize that light as a foundation on which to reach higher and higher in our pursuit of living the ideals of our tradition. I could reflect on that every night, not because I wrote it, forget that, but because in these times, at the end of the day, some of you may have heard of the practice of a, a, a gratitude journal. In this time, we need to reflect every day on what's good because there's plenty that's not. Okay, go on, Yakir. Another midah, I won't even read this or comment, is truth, emet. But let's face it, in today's world, what is emet? How do we know who's speaking? Everybody's speaking their version of the emet. Uh, that's actually a good, venerable Israeli tradition. And, and in Israel, we all know, we all speak it at the same time. Uh, actually, we do that here too, right? So, but... How do we know who to believe and what to believe and where to trust? Another midah, which I didn't put in this presentation, bitachon. I don't need to tell Israelis what the word bitachon means in modern Israel, modern Hebrew. Bitachon in a Musar sense is trust, but it's 10,010% trust in God. Well, you know what? I found a Haredi author who's writing Musar books in Jerusalem. I don't know who he is. But he said, you know, just in case you can't relate to the God piece? What about bitachon in yourself? And we need bitachon in ourselves at a time like this. We need bitachon in the people we live with, the people who we trust our health and our lives with. And again, that's an experience that doesn't need to be explained to anybody who grew up in Israel, who's lived in Israel. Okay, let, let me stop there. I could, I could literally talk about me, don't, Yakir, can you go to the last slide? And maybe this is one that you can, that's it. Oh, that's one, that one. So um, maybe Yakir can send this to you later. But here are some resources. Um, some of them are Boston-based, because I did a version of this earlier last week for our community here. But the Musar Institute, there's the website. Another great organization that's doing a lot of the same stuff and making a lot of stuff available, the Institute for Jewish Spirituality. Skip the next few, they're all Boston. Let it ripple, 
is the film I mentioned, The Making of a Mensch. If you're connected to a synagogue, your synagogue, and I gave you my email address. So if you want have a question or you want to have a Zoom chat, or I'm happy to, to just speak with people and 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 help people see um, you know if there's a place for them with this in their lives. And I think there's a place for all of us because we all need balance. Let, one last slide, which is Rav Lopian again. Musar is making the heart feel what the mind already knows. And I added, and we need to know and remember, we're not in this alone. Your being on this call, not with me, but with one another, not just tonight, but two nights ago and two nights from now, that's a reminder we're not alone. And in a time where we can't reach out and put our arms around one another's shoulders or hug one another, we need to find the ways to give spiritual hugs and to uh, create a sense of, of, of togetherness because it's a dark time. And uh, I dare say, uh, with Pesach on the horizon, uh, none of us is going to sit, if we sit at a Seder table and, and engage with any level of the Haggadah and tell the story of our people long ago, the meaning of the plagues is going to be incredibly powerful this year because we're living through our own plague. So questions, comments, arguments, whatever. If anyone wants, you're more than welcome to unmute yourself. Um, yes, Linda, I see that you wish to. Hi. Yeah, I have a quick question. When you started, you were talking about um, keeping a, no, learning a midah, focusing on it, and then uh, each day reflecting on how you've done with it, where you've seen it expressed, what you might need work on, where you've had success. Is there any book that's already pre-printed that has a little bit about the midot and has- Yes. That kind of journal. That yes, one. yes. So um, there are many books. If you email me, I can send you a whole list. But the book that I would recommend, Kodem mm -hmm. uh, Kol, yeah. is Everyday Holiness Beautiful. by Alan Marinus, who is the teacher I've quoted several times, my teacher. I saw him on Zoom yesterday. And Everyday Holiness, because Alan, the first book, three parts to the book. The first part is the history of the Musar movement, which I gave you a, a tipa tonight. The third part of the book is how do you do it? And the whole middle is one chapter after another on different midot. Now I will, I, I just want to be honest, it's a great book. I love Ellen's book. I reread it all the time before I teach my own groups. Um, and that's another part of Musar. It, it's often done in a group, so you're not doing it alone. Yael was here before, I don't know if she still is, but Yael is in my group that I'm gonna see Thursday morning here in Boston, except now I see them on Zoom. And this is my second year with them and I have groups I've been with longer and groups I've been with shorter. And we work together on Amida. Doesn't mean that individuals aren't thinking about other things. Um, and you can go to the Musar Institute website and learn about that too. But I would say everyday holiness is a great starting point. But you can always email me and say, I'm thinking about this midah. Do you have anything that might help me? So Rabbi Eric, I wonder, um, for our unique time, what is the midah that you think, or what is the question? What is the emotional and, and spiritual and physical question that as a Musar teacher, um, we need to focus these days. And if you can give us, leave us, because we are very practical as Israelis. Yeah. We love to leave with like two, three things that you think we can do. Um, I, one of the Hasidic um, saying is that, why do you need a rabbi? Because you can read everything. And the answer is that when you read a book, you read what you want, and the rabbi force you to read the chapter you don't want to open. Um, so I wonder, for us as a rabbi, and before we need to say goodbye and thank you so much, right. I wonder what is a midah and if you can give us like two methods or ideas that we can take with us. So it's a little bit of a different answer. That was a question and a story from a, a guy who grew up in B'nai Brak. 
So I'm going to give a different answer to the P. You, yes, you can go to the rabbi. I think I would go to Pirkei Avot, Kne Lacha Chaver. Even more important than a rabbi, and I'm saying that as a rabbi, get yourself a Chavruta partner. If you're going to read everyday holiness, read it with someone else. Okay? And, I mean, that, that's part of what I love about the debate and the vigorous debate that we engage in in, in Israel, because that's a form of chevruta. Hopefully we're listening as much as we're talking, but it's, it's important to not do it alone. Um, as for the midot, you know, Yakir, I gave you a couple of the top ones. I think minuchata nefesh, finding, even if it's five minutes a day, to step away from the computer, to step away from the work that you're doing now at home, to step away from even your children and your spouses and just say, maybe it's five minutes of meditation. Maybe it's five minutes of singing or listening to David Broza sing, Yihiyatov. For me, that could be a Musar practice. Okay, I kid you not, um, because I need to believe that and I'm not quite there. Um, I will tell you that the Midah that I'm working on right now, and I'm actually back tomorrow, have to start studying and writing an article for the Musar Institute. We're doing four sessions like this on Musar in a time of crisis. The first one is tomorrow, and I thank God I'm the fourth one. The Midah I'm working on is Seder, not Seder in the sense of Passover. Our lives, my life has been upended. And I wake up in the morning, you know, I sit with the coffee and I read the news. You know, if I have a morning appointment, okay, so I got to get down here to the computer. And I, I've been telling myself the last couple of days, no, you need some structure. It doesn't all have to be about work. I, I need to get back to reading, not just the news, but a book. I, I have a whole host of instruments, including a couple I've wanted to learn for years. Well, if I don't take the time now, to learn the mandolin that I bought myself last year. Um, it'll never happen. So say there, I need a different sense of order because the order in my life has been completely upended. Mm -hmm. I need minuchat nefesh. I need anava to remember that no matter how much I think I know more than the people screaming at me from the television set, I don't know what I don't know. I need to keep pursuing Emmet, truth. And I could go on. So it's not one yuck here. And here's what Alan Marinus says. We all have our own soul curriculum. I can't tell you what your midah is in this moment. We need gvura. We need strength. We need omets lev. We need courage. Which is more than patience. I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Eric, so much. And thank each one of you that you took this hour to, to I think we felt himself um, in a way by, you know, just being here, listening to your voice, learning about that, meditating your words. Um, in your emails that you're going to get, um, you're going to get also the, um, the um, is it okay to share with them, right? The PowerPoint? Um, thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Eric. We're going to be here again on Thursday. Um, on um, Gvanim Limud um, preparation for Passover in Hebrew with Anat Katsir. Um, and also we are going to have Kabbalat Shabbat Israelit. We had it last weekend just before Shabbat. And it with was Ronnie? We, no, we had it with uh, David Broza. Um, wow. So we had it with David Broza. We, it was incredible. 1,000 families gathered together. This week is going to be with Anat Saruf and with Sivan Rav Meir that um, she, she's going to, to teach us. Thank you so much. Next Tuesday with Rabbi Amnalia Boards in English. Rabbi Eric, Todaraba, thank you for being part of our community. We love you. And I hope I'm to see sure you again. Be again. safe, everybody. Todaraba. Todaraba. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.